Good luck with the lecture. Thank yeah. you for helping me. <laughs> you were most helpful. Okay. It's a lecture file. And now we turn into two new models that we are going to learn under the heading uh, Monopoly Practices. It's not pure monopoly, but it's close to. And these three models are three simple but still important models that you need to understand in depth and when we build later on the more complex models we need to be familiar with the simple ones so we start with the simple ones today and very soon the models will be complicated enough to my simple word next picture this model is what is called dominant firm price leadership model this is a model that we will find out there in real life it consists of one big dominant firm and many small fringe firms the dominant firm act as a monopolist maximize profit where they always find the equilibrium where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost and once the dominant firm has decided the price level as a price leader the fringe firms will act as price takers they just behave as price takers and find for themselves exactly the the equilibrium where price equal to marginal cost and for them price is equal to marginal revenue because they are price takers they take the price that has been decided by the dominant firm as fixed and they can always expand but when they expand they can sell more to exactly the same price as the fixed price decided by the price leader so here are two players one will act as a monopolist maximize marginal revenue equal to marginal cost and one act as a proper competitive player take the price as given and decides how much to produce when price equal to marginal cost So let's turn to the model, figure file 1. Here we start with an industry that is called U.S. Steel, a big steel producer. We just use the concept U.S. And the demand function, P, is equal to 100 minus Q and the big one US steel has a margin cost curve 
that is linear, starts at 25, and the big one has a marginal cost equal to 25 plus 1 third Q. 25 plus 1 third Q. Why come is the dominant firm more cost efficient? That can be many reasons for that. Either it can be a patent and more modern technology that they can protect through a patent system. They can have control over different resources. They simply can have gone through a learning by doing process. And that happens if they started producing earlier than the French companies. So they have learned to be more cost efficient and there is a learning process where the newcomers, the French companies, need to learn and they will always end up being less cost efficient than the big one the U.S. company. And then the fringe supply curve starts at 25 where P equal to 25 plus 2Q. So the supply curve for these two players will start at the same point, 25, but they have a very different loop, very different loop. The fringe supply curve is much steeper, telling us that when they decide to produce more, the marginal cost will increase much faster, telling us that this is a less cost-efficient player compared to U.S. steel. Mm -hmm. You see that? How can we now find the residual demand curve? When the big player will move along the demand curve, Let's start at price equal to 75. At price equal to 75, the production, the quantity will be exactly 25 units. And that is exactly where the fringe firms will capture the entire market producing 25 and there will be no market for US steel, the big price leader, price leader. So when the price level will be 75, the fringe players has taken over. Let's now see when the price level will be 25. What happens? At 25, The fringe supply curve will tell us that they will produce nothing, nothing at all. And with a price level equal to 25, the big U.S. steel company will capture the entire market producing exactly 75 units, 75 units. And in between the price level 75 and 25, you will have the black line going from the point 25, 75 to 75, zero. 
that is what we now call the residual demand curve for US steel. So for every price level that the things that the price leader will decide, they will have to reflect how much will the fringe firms supply to every alternative price level. The price leader decides first, moving first, and the fringe supplier moves second, and we end up in an equilibrium where they as players will both try to maximize profit. So the black curve now is called the residual demand curve for US steel. And then we just look for the marginal revenue curve for this U.S. residual demand curve, and that is the black curve that will be twice as steep, starting at 75, and since it's a linear curve, twice as steep will give us the marginal revenue curve. So this is how we can describe the market. And this residual demand curve is equal to P is equal to 75 minus 2 third Q U for prices in between 25 and 75. That is the residual demand curve. And the twice as steep curve is the black one. Where will this game end? Let's go to 5, 2. So the price leader will move along the residual demand curve trying to find exactly the combination of price and quantity along that residual demand curve where we exactly will have marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. And you see the marginal cost curve for U.S. steel will intersect with the marginal revenue curve where we have quantity 30. Can you see that? That is the intersection between the marginal cost curve supply curve and the marginal revenue curve. That is exactly where they will achieve maximum profit. And then when the quantity is 30, you just move upwards until you have the intersection with the residual demand curve and you reach the point Z, Z. And there's where the price level will be. At Z, the price level will be 55. And you as steel will produce 30 units and the fringe suppliers 
How much will they produce? Mm. When the price level will be 55 decided by the price leader, then the Finch supply curve will tell us that they maximize profit where the fixed price 55 is just just equal to yes 15 so the fringe suppliers will produce just half the supply from the US steel and totally that was correct that totally you have 45 <laughs> probably that's what you thought you just looked for we add them together 30 plus 15 and we end up with the total market supply equal to 45 and the consumers will have their price equal to 55 so this is in a way two players where one of the players will behave just as a monopolist that is the price leaner and the follower will act as if they were in a perfect competitive system taking the prices as fixed <coughs> maximizing their profit when price equal to margin cost and what US Steel will have to consider when US Steel decides how much to produce and what will be the price level they just will have to consider exactly what the follower will do and the follower will be the fringe firms that the dominant firm will understand as a follower will understand that they will take the price as, give, as given and the price leader will know exactly the fringe supply curve so here the US deal as a player they have full information they know exactly the fringe supply curve they know how cost efficient they are and they know how many they are and they know that they will act as a price taker mm -hmm. so this is a kind of game and we find the solution with a simple technique using the residual demand curve using just here figures pictures to illustrate the dominant firm price leadership model so this is the model two players and when, when I say two players I mean that there is one price leader and there are many acting as if the prices were fixed as if they were in a perfect competitive system okay then this model shows us that there is and dynamic solution that we will have to consider because this is not a static world and definitely the dominant 
firm price leader, they will also behave strategically. And the fringe suppliers, if they earn a positive profit, what will happen? If they earn a positive profit, you will have an entering game. They will just enter because the fringe companies will have a positive profit. And since we know that when the companies have incentives to enter because of a positive profit, they will actually do that. So this is also an entering game where there will be more players entering this market because they can see that they can earn a positive profit. What happens if the number of fringe firms double? If it doubles and they have exactly the same knowledge as the other fringe suppliers concerning how to produce just as cost efficient as the rest of the fringe firms. They enter and the fringe supply curve will have a shift outwards. What happens with an outward shift? Let's see when we move to picture 5.3. Can you now see that we have the same demand curve, the industry demand curve, P is equal to 100 minus Q. We have the same supply curve for the dominant firm. The US deal will be exactly the same demand curve, supply curve I mean. And from this figure you see that the shift inwards or outwards I mean will tell us that the new supply curve will start at 25 and now the supply curve because of doubling the number of firms since they have incentives to enter we end up with the fringe supply curve P equal to 25 plus Q what does that tell us about the residual demand curve? Well, what happens if the dominant firm decides the price level to be 62.5? Then the fringe supply curve will tell us that they will produce exactly 37.5, capture the entire market with no production left for the dominant firm. So if the dominant firm will put the price level exactly at 62.5, that will give them no level at all for producing any quantity at all zero. What if the dominant firm decides the price level to be 25? The dominant firm will produce 75 as in figure 532. So you now see the kink. We start at 100 moves up to 75 and the residual demand curve has a kick.
nothing and ends up in 62.5 that black line is now the shift in the residual demonker. And again, the dominant verb will always move along this curve and maximize the profit. And where will we end? We have a new marginal revenue curve that will be twice as steep now starting at 62.5 can you see that 62.5 and where will now this marginal revenue curve intersect with the US steel supply curve where they maximize the profit exactly where the quantity will be 28.125 ending up in the point Z and the price level 484375 hmm? and how will now the fringe firms respond to this lower price level because you remember from figure 5.3 that the price level is now decided by the dominant firm to be lower. How much will now the fringe supply curve on the price level 48 and up with and that is exactly 23.4375 huh. and you remember in figure 5.2 the fringe firms produced 15. So they have captured a higher market share. Why come? Because of more companies entering because they had kept a positive profit and there will be an incentive to enter. Can you see that? So, totally now, they produce 51.5825 to the price level of 48.4375. So, it's a higher production, it's a lower price, and it's a much higher market share for the fringe firms. But it's quite strange now that the dominant firm should be so stupid that the dominant firm just will be passive and just ignore the behavior from the fringe companies and leave a higher market share for them. Why come they should be so stupid? Could it be a leader that will play X inefficiency game? Probably not. Could it be that The fringe, the dominant firm, 
stands are not learned? Probably not. Could it be that the fringe firms are smarter than the dominant firm? Probably not. So, later on, we will play the entry game. And that's when we will learn that the dominant firm will behave strategically and try to prevent the newcomers to enter and they will then behave strategically with several actions trying to prevent newcomers from entering to increase the profit for the dominant firm. So this is just playing the simple game where the dominant firm does not learn just passive observing that the fringe suppliers will take over a larger share of the market and just letting them do that is not very realistic. So later on we will learn the entry game and how to change the rules of the game. That's what we are going to learn later on. Change the rules of the game through strategic actions. And that's under part three, business strategy. Of course, business strategy is to act strategically, to increase their own profit, to understand the market much deeper, and to capture a higher profit. Mm -hmm. Then we can go back. Five three was the dynamic equilibrium. The dominant firm in this kind of market will lose market share. And that is not very realistic. So the dynamic equilibrium in the third part of the textbook will learn us that the incumbent will change the rules of the game in favor of its own profit and behave strategically. And that's when we are going to learn game theory. And next chapter, <coughs> that will be chapter 6, <coughs> just to remind you, that's what we skip. That's what we not read. So chapter 6 is where you just close your eyes <coughs> and go on to chapter 7. So next week, I will teach over chapter 7. And for the first time, we start the introduction of game theory. But to some extent, we can say that the dominant firm price leadership model is a kind of introduction to this game theoretic approach. Two players, a market agreement, one leader, one follower, and strange, but in this model, what we concluded with that in the dynamic equilibrium, the follower will be the winner because the price leader will be passive, and that's not realistic. Next picture. This one 
is a natural. And that is contestable market. That's a model that first for the first time was introduced in nineteen eighty two by three famous economists Bob Wall, Pansar and Winish. And they just ended up with a model that they called contestable markets. This is a model where it's not the competition in itself that ends up in price equal to modern cost, but it is potential competition. So now there is a distinction between competition and potential competition. And potential competition, as they said in this famous article, can't be enough to end up in a perfect competitive solution. Price equal to marginal cost. Why come? And even though you might have a natural monopolist with characterized by falling average costs and falling long-term average cost, that is when we conclude that we have economies of scale and a natural monopolist. But still, when we have a natural monopolist, just potential competition can be enough. And for political reasons, Ronald Reagan, that was the president in the US in 1982, he loved this model. <laughs> and Margaret Thatcher loved this model. They are both conservatives. And they loved this model. Why come? Because they could, could conclude that there is no problem with such a thing as a monopolist with market power in a market system. No problem because potential competition can be enough to put the pressure on prices downwards so that consumers can be happy and have the prices equal to marginal cost at the level where the average cost is at its minimum. Just like the perfect competitive solution. So they said that uh, there will be no reason for any interruption any regulations in the market because these potential competitive forces will be just enough to keep on going with a free market system with no regulation, no interruptions with the market forces because they will just regulate themselves through potential competition. Do you believe in this model? Is this a realistic one? Why come? Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Let's not just let's just see how it works. You remember? In the perfect competitive system, we had several assumptions that we needed to have fulfilled if we could conclude that we had a perfect competitive system. We remember that we had to have many players, many 
sellers and many buyers, we had to believe in full information. All the players were informed about where the prices were lowest, and they all knew the most cost-efficient technology that was easy to copy for all the players. And we needed the transaction cost to be zero. We needed the system to have no entry and exit costs. And finally, we concluded that to have the perfect competitive solution, we also needed to have players with no external costs. So the assumptions we have discussed is where we will find the problems when we discuss the assumptions. What about the contestable markets? The first assumption is that entry is free. The incumbent, the player out there already in the market, will have no cost advantage, telling us that there will be no such thing as learning by doing. There will be no such thing as uh, patent. There will be no such thing as price differentiation, product differentiation, I mean. They will have the newcomers, exactly the same cost efficiency as the incumbent. Is that realistic? E here we also will have to conclude that there will be no advantage for the incumbent with advertising. So if the incumbent have been advertising and have invested heavily in advertising, there will be no such thing as a cumulative effect. So when the newcomer will enter, they will have exactly the same cost efficiency. And the next assumption we take after the break